Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Jen Dribben. I am the VP of Government Affairs here at the National Aquarium. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture, which is part of the Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series, Change Makers, Making Conservation Personal. Throughout this series, we are honored to bring Baltimore individuals who have devoted themselves to creating, two Baltimore individuals who have devoted themselves to creating positive change, be it to address climate change and promote resiliency, improve ocean and human health, or build needed diversity in the conservation space. We believe their stories can offer insights and inspiration from local, regional, and international quests to make this blue planet a better place for us all. The Aquarium has had the pleasure of hosting the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series for more than 15 years now, thanks to the generosity of the Bank family. As many of you know, Marjorie was a photojournal photojournalist, environmentalist, diver, and explorer, and when she passed away in 1994, her family endowed these lectures in her honor. It's been deeply gratifying for the aquarium to play a part in sharing Marjorie's love of the ocean and her sense of adventure with the community of like-minded people. In addition to recognizing the Bank family for making tonight's event possible, I'd like to acknowledge the entire aquarium family of members and donors who make it possible for the aquarium to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits, education programs, conservation initiatives, and more. I'd also like to acknowledge National Aquarium staff and volunteers, those are, who are here tonight, as well as those who are not. We have an amazing team that I am, I am proud to be a part of, a team of people who not only work hard, but they care very deeply. I'd also like to acknowledge National Aquarium, or sorry, Quick housekeeping, if you submitted a question online for the Q&A portion, uh, we have them. Thank you for submitting them. Online submission of questions is over, but we've distributed blank index cards. And we encourage you to jot down a few questions. Um, we'll collect those and then pass them up, and we'll do a, a great Q&A um, tonight with Gina. So a little bit about Gina McCarthy. For more than three decades, Gina McCarthy has dedicated her career in public service to environmental protection and public health. Her work has led to significant local, state, and federal actions to advance environmental, clean energy, public transportation, and public health goals, consistent with a growing economy across the United States. She's held senior positions in Massachusetts state government, serving five governors, and served as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, where she began an initiative called No Child Left Inside to introduce families to the natural world by visiting state parks. Ms. McCarthy also helped design and implement the nine state regional greenhouse gas initiative, the nation's first cap and trade program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, of which Maryland is a proud member. From 2013 to 2017, she served as administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama. As administrator, McCarthy was the nation's leading advocate for common sense strategies to protect public health and the environment. During her tenure leading the EPA, the Clean Power Plan was finalized, which set the first national standards to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for fossil fuel fired power plants and demonstrated the United States' strong commitment to climate action, sparking broad international support to adopt the Paris Climate Agreement. Under her leadership, EPA also finalized the Clean Water Rule to protect rivers and streams that 117 million Americans rely on as their source of drinking water. Since leaving the Obama administration, Ms. McCarthy joined Pegasus Capital Advisors, a private equity firm, as an operating advisor focused on sustainability and wellness investments. She was a fellow at Harvard in the Chan School of Public Health and the Kennedy School of Government. At Harvard, she was recently appointed as the director of the T.H. Chan School's new Center for Health and Global Environment, leading an effort to turn the challenge of climate change into an opportunity to use science to motivate actions that improve health today while moving us toward a more sustainable future. Ms. McCarthy continues to be a voice of reason for the importance of science informing public policy. From media interviews to high-level forums, such as the recent Global Climate Action Summit in California, 
We are honored to have her here with us this evening. Thanks. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And please welcome me in, or join me in welcoming Gina McCarthy. Thank you, Jen. Hey, it's great to be here. Everybody comfy? Settle in. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, it is wonderful to be here at the National Aquarium. I think you like have the best mission ever. It's uh, changing the way humanity cares for our planet. So the only thing I want to say to the staff are two things. Thank you for what you do, and you need to work harder. It's not working yet. People just are dissing the planet all over the place. We have to, we have to get a grip, uh, but it, it, it is great. Um, and I got a chance to walk around and see some of the exhibits, and it was, it was really fun. I even got to see the turtle. Yeah, baby, it was hiding, but I, well, we found it. Jen found it, honed right in on it. Uh, but what, what I think I like best is the science-based education that you do. Because we really need to inform and inspire young people today about our natural world. We need to get them connected to the natural world as early as humanly possible. And I don't know about you, but I really could use some inspiration these days. I find that today's uh, d uh, today pr uh, pretty difficult. And I, I will tell you one of the things that a that, uh, uh, quote that I always think about um, I, 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 it just will never leave me. It's an old African proverb, and it says, we will conserve only what we love, and we will love only what we understand, and we're only going to understand what we are taught. So if we don't purposely support places like this aquarium, that can engage young people early in their lives and teach them the importance of the natural world, teach them science, then we are going to use a lot of, uh, of our energy trying to reconnect with them later, and it's never going to be as successful. I don't know about you, but I got hooked on the natural world at a really young age. So that's why this aquarium is really so important and why I'm excited to be here. You know, you mentioned that I launched something called the No Child Left Inside Initiative, and it was really one of the most fun things, and I decided to do it because when I was in Connecticut, I got asked a lot, what are the biggest environmental challenges? And I think everybody thought I'd talk about air pollution or what. And basically, I told them two things. One we'll talk about quite a bit tonight. And it's called climate change, which I think is, is a, a one of the most important, if not critical, issues of our time. It is an existential issue. It is not about the health of the planet. The planet just finds us annoying. It doesn't care if we destroy it, just shifts and, and does whatever it wants. It's actually about the health of people, human beings. That's what is at risk with a changing climate, and we'll talk about that. But the other thing I always used to tell them is that, that I think one of the biggest risks of the environment is the fact that kids don't go out and play anymore. And I mean that in all seriousness, because y you really need to think about the fact that today, most people have no idea where their trash goes when they put it out on the sidewalk. Where does their water come from, right? And when they flush the toilet, where does it go? Where does your food get grown? How does it get to where it gets? All of those things are fundamental issues that I knew when I was six years old, because you could see it. Our, our trash went to this dump that was burning. It was a lovely wetland area where you had a bulldozer that all the trash got thrown in there and you just, you just piled it down and, and burned it when you wanted to burn it. Now, I'm not suggesting that is a step forward, <laughs> but at least I knew where it was going and I felt bad about it. At least I understood why we needed to recycle, because if we didn't recycle, we were just going to keep tossing all the rubbish out of the car window as we were driving along. I mean, that was, and I know some of you are near my age, and you'll remember this, right? But today, that's not what's happening. Today, we don't have a visible 
hold on the value of our natural resources and the way in which we overuse those resources in a way that will limit our ability to have a healthy and sustainable world. Not, not just healthy and sustainable, but also a just world, an equitable world. Because you and I know that people die from pollution every single day. I figured that out when I first worked in, in the, the community health centers because I was interested in the delivery of healthcare services to folks that didn't have a lot of means to pay them. Only when I got there, I realized that everybody walking in the door, it was in Providence, everybody was walking in the door was, was really having problems because they had lead in their water, lead in their paint, they didn't have enough money to buy nutritious food. I mean, and the air quality was bad. You know, that's what was bringing them to the door looking for healthcare services. And that's when I started to shift and I realized that all these so-called environmental agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency, was actually not about the environment. It was a public health agency. We care about saving people's lives. We care about allowing kids to go to school instead of getting captured by asthma attacks or allergies from, from, from uh, all kinds of different growth that we see today. We care about families being able to go to work instead of staying at home caring for sick people. That was our measure of success when I worked at EPA. That was my measure of success when I worked at Massachusetts DEP. But at that point in time when all of these agencies were coming to be, we realized that the challenge was that, that people at that point in time could see, feel, and taste pollution. It was easy to see. And we made demands. Because when I lived in the city of Boston and I swam in Boston Harbor as my summer vacation, it was so contaminated that you'd have to pull off the tar balls from your legs. We used to have a, a real a game when we were kids in Lowell and Lawrence, which is where our textile manufacturing was. Uh, the, me and my two sisters used to bet on what color the river would be when we went by, because the river was either bright red, bright orange, bright green, bright blue, depending upon what the textile industry was doing that day. You, you know, there was no question that we needed change to happen. And that's when the Environmental Protection Agency was formed back in those days because it was so palpable, the pollution that we were creating, that we knew we couldn't continue to live like this. Those were the days when Los Angeles was shrouded in air pollution when Orange County got its name be not because of the produce it produced, but because of the haze that was all over Orange County. And it reminded me of those days when I visited San Francisco just three weeks ago at the height of the fires. And everybody was walking around and I felt like I was in Beijing, China with all of the masks that people were wearing instead of being in the United States of America. So you make progress, you go back. You make progress, you go back. But in the United States of America, we need to get real again, and we need to move real fast to take care of the environmental challenges we have. And the environmental challenges are not partisan. They are not a belief system. They are facts. They are the fact that in the United States of America, we make evidence-based decisions based on real data real information. And when you do that, you can look air pollution in the eye, including carbon pollution, and you can find a way forward. That's what this country has relied on. That's what we need to keep doing. You know, in the early days, do you know that the best president of the United States of America created the Environmental Protection Agency? He was a Republican. Can anybody guess? Richard Nixon! All right, that thing about him being the greatest was a joke. It was perhaps the only thing that he actually did that was of worthwhile to discuss. But nevertheless, he wasn't the first Republican to care about the environment. That would be Teddy Roosevelt, who created the National Park System. And what a tribute to the Republicans to have, have moved that forward. 
And what a tribute to him and John Muir and others who understood the beauty of our natural resources and that we needed nature not just for what it can do for us in terms of resources that we could suck out of the system, but what we needed to be surrounded by the natural world that would not just feed us, but feed our souls. That's what No Child Left Inside was all about. It was connecting young kids to the outside world because unless you have sat at the shore of an ocean at night and looked up at the stars, you will never know how insignificant your problems really are. My blood pressure goes down about 100 points, which tells you where it normally is when I go to the ocean or when I go for a hike in the forest and I see the green that is about 250 different shades of green and you listen and when I was a kid we used to go to an, ur an urban area right up right in the city of Boston and my dad used to take the whole neighborhood in one big, uh, what do you call, station wagon. No one wore seat belts, I'm very sorry to say, but we didn't have them then. Never mind airbags. And we used to go and we'd just rummage around in the forest. We'd make bows and arrows and try to kill one another. <laughs> Mostly we, it didn't work, but it was fun. Um, hopefully my father was watching, but I'm not sure of that. <laughs> and, and you know, you'd be outside all the time doing unstructured things. You'd go up to a log and you'd turn it over and you'd realize that underneath that log was teeming with wildlife. It was a whole little city under there. And you realize that the world was complicated. It was precious. It was real. We were just a small and, a, and really, at times, insignificant part of that natural resource. We respected the outside world as a result. That's why we demanded that pollution get cleaned. And my concern is that if you don't have places like this, how do kids that grow up in an urban area ever get that same sense of wonder that Rachel Carson talks about. How do they get to know about the natural world and be conservationists of tomorrow? How do they get to be the environmental stewards? So I congratulate you for supporting the aquarium and I congratulate every single person who works here who is actually doing a wonderful job and a job that is a gift to all of us because hopefully we can all bind together and realize that even though we can't see, feel, and taste pollution today, we still have huge challenges in the world and even in this country with communities that have been left behind, with challenges like climate change. And we need to stop pretending that we don't understand the science and start once again making evidence-based decisions like we're in the United States of America and not ignorant. You know, my favorite quote, oh, I brought it here. My favorite quote is a Carl Sagan quote. He said, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science or technology. <laughs> Don't you love that? That's Carl Sagan. Go, Carl Sagan. I miss him. That's the challenge that we really face today because today we have an administration in Washington that doesn't want to pay attention to the science. In fact, they're actually specifically attacking not just the science, but the scientists who talk about the science because they don't like the outcomes. They don't like what it means. They don't like the work that it's gonna produce. They don't like the direction of the future when you look at what the future of the Earth might be if we don't change the direction that we're taking today. And I know I wake up every morning and it takes me about 10 minutes before I put a smile on my face, but that smile does not go away until I go to bed at night because I am not going to be disappointed about today. It just is a reminder of how hard we have to work and that we have to get hopeful and we have to get busy and we have to start taking action and we have to start acting like a democracy where the people call the shots. And that's what we have to do today. So every morning, this is how I wake up. I pout a little bit. But then I hear my husband upstairs, and generally he has on either MSNBC or CNN, and he's screaming and yelling about whatever was tweeted the night before, <laughs> which is five minutes of the 10 minutes that I, that I take 
without a smile on my face. And so I go upstairs and I say, Ken, I love you dearly. We've been married for 30 hmm, something years. I, and I say, with really all love and affection, just shut up. <laughs> Turn the TV off. Go for a walk around Jamaica Pond. We live right in the pond. It's awesome. Take a look at the world outside. Get a grip on yourself. We actually are doing really great things in the United States, and I am not going to be taken down by any of the news I hear on TV. And if you can't get a grip, if you can't put a smile on your face, when I am sitting here looking at how they're going to dismantle every single rule or regulation or policy or thought that anyone might have had at any point in time during the Obama administration, if I can listen to that and only spend 10 minutes of griping, then get back, have fun, have a cup of coffee, turn the radio on to some nice music, and get a grip on yourself. Because we are not going to give up. We are not going to be losers. We are going to be hopeful, and we're going to move as science tells us we have to move. We are in a place of science. It's called not just the National Aquarium, but it's called the United States of America, and it's called Planet Earth. And we better figure out what we need to do to keep our home healthy. Now, I know that, that, that I did a lot of work to try to clean up our water, our rivers and our streams. I know that I did a lot of work on climate change. I know I did a lot of work on clean air. And I know a lot of that is, is being talked about as, as uh, so yesterday, because there's lots of announcements that have been made about pulling out of the Paris Agreement. And I have a lot of people who come up to me and say, oh, Gina, how are you? And I say, you know, I'm pretty good because nothing's actually happened. This administration hasn't completed any one of the rollbacks that they have suggested they've already completed. You know why? Because it's an amazing thing. It takes a rule to get rid of a rule. And you know what the basis of rules are? Law, science, and public process. They have failed on one of the three every time they've done anything. They have been challenged in court 19 times. They have won once. It was just an implementation delay. So don't get discouraged. Don't think that all of a sudden it is hopeless. Don't think that we will not come back and we will not be able to address the challenges that you see that this aquarium tries to teach everybody about how do we live within the means of the resources of our planet. How do we work together to make sure that we're protecting our ocean instead of having plastics take over such a large portion of our beautiful water that we are trying to protect? Instead of neglecting the acidity that's happening in our oceans, the rising temperatures, the die off of coral reefs. These are all depressing issues, but don't tell me that we can't figure out how to be resilient enough to get it back. And don't tell me that we shouldn't start today, because if we didn't do it yesterday, we had best do it today. So we just have to get together and hang out with one another. Stop watching negative things. Stop thinking that we've lost when in reality, every single step forward that we took on climate change is still in play today. Every single one of them. And what's interesting and exciting about today is that it's not just about what happens at the federal level that really matters. I spend a lot of time with actually going to colleges and talking to young people because they, I've realized that, you know, I'm 64, they're like 18. Big difference, right? I kind of have a little bit better sense of history. And when you're 18, the only president of the United States you've ever known is Barack Obama. So if you have a next president talking about getting rid of all that, you think your life has been a wash everything's lost and everything's gone. And I am going to them saying that is not true. Things change. The world has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. I never ever thought I wouldn't have a landline phone. <laughs> what is that? 
I have one, but we just threw a we just threw it aside because it's cheaper when you're on Comcast to get one of those packages and it includes a landline and you can't get out of the damn thing. That's the only use it provides to me. It's for all of the people, telemarketers, that I never answer. You know, who would have thought that? Who would imagine that India that has over a billion people, actually more than that, they're going to be able to establish an energy system in India without a grid. Who ever heard of such a thing? We're going to be able to do it too when we figure out that renewable energy is the winner in the game. All right, so people are worried about what's happening to the car rules. I'll tell you what's happening to the car rules, nothing. Because the car companies made a mistake. They went and asked this president to dismantle their own security system. They asked them to go and get rid of all the rules about clean cars, and now you've got them all saying, well, <laughs> never mind, I didn't really mean that because I think that I have to produce electric vehicles for China anyways because they control the car market, so we might as well hang out with those because they provide me certainty. That, so nothing's going to happen with them. The clean power plan, which is the rule that we did to lower the greenhouse gas emissions from our uh, power plants, our utilities, that's another one that's interesting to watch because, frankly, we did it right. We figured out how to save lives, clean the air, and save the planet all in one swoop. And now they're proposing to make a change that does none of those things. In fact, it costs thousands of lives every year. It's never going to happen in the United States of America because there's this strange thing about Democrats and Republicans. They don't agree on anything, but if you take away clean air from them, they won't like it. Democrats or Republicans. If their water supply goes down for their constituents, I know who they called and it was me. They didn't care who I work for, but I damn well better fix it. If they had a contaminated site and they had people worried about whether or not they were at risk around that site, they wanted it cleaned up as fast as humanly possible. And all I told them was, I'd like some money. <laughs> These things are not things that, that the United States will ever accommodate if it means rolling back fundamental protections to our health today or to the future that we rely on to hand to our children. Because it's our moral responsibility to hand them a world that's better than the world that we had. And we have to remember that. And I, I tell those students to stop worrying about what you're reading and just get active. Work in your own communities. Look at what's happening in the real world in our lives today. Because I've worked for six governors, five of them were Republicans, and I made progress each and every time. I even worked for Governor Mitt Romney, remember him? He's a Republican, now he's a senator, he used to be something else, run for president. And he was a governor in Massachusetts, and when I worked for him, we put out a clean power plan for, I'm sorry, we put out a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, climate change plan for the state of Massachusetts. You can make progress with anyone if you do it right. And in the Obama administration, when we did rules, we did them right. We followed the law, we followed the science, and it's gonna be really hard because this administration, in order to undo those, needs to find fault with those, and what I say to them is good luck to that. Because what we did was respect the public process. We didn't just check a box and say I had a hearing. We went and did hundreds of, of uh, work with, with all of the constituencies, whether they were local grassroots or whether they were the business community, so that we knew how to do it in a way that would stick, in a way that would be reasonable, in a way that would be supportive of a growing economy. And we also knew that carbon in the end was nothing more than an air pollutant. We didn't call it climate change, we called it carbon pollution. Because I'm sick of climate change being made into something that is so huge nobody can fix. The hell with that. <laughs> we have to fix it. It is pollution. We whack down the pollution before we can do it again. If we work together, we can do it again. 
And when I went to Harvard after, after being in the administration, I spent a bit of time both at the Kennedy School and the Harvard School of Public Health, where I now am, and I realized that the most interesting thing about this generation is not that they're really young, which is interesting, but it's the fact that they care about social justice and equity issues. They care about it. And pollution is not an equal opportunity killer. It always go as goes after the weakest. It always goes after low minority communities, communities that struggle with, with, their, with poverty. It goes after our kids and it goes after our elderly. If you want to think about carbon pollution, then think about the fact that there are nine million people in the world that die every single year from exposure to pollution and 93% of those people are in low and middle income countries because we have an obligation to address this issue if we want to claim that everybody in the world has an equal opportunity to move ahead and be happy, and if we want to recognize that we have a constitutional right in this country to have clean air and clean water and clean and safe land. That is our constitutional right. And so if you look at carbon pollution, it is preventing us, no matter how many widgets we wear, that tell us how many steps we did, what does the air pollution look like, we have a constitutional right to be able to take care of ourselves and live a healthy life. Carbon pollution is taking and wiping that out. It's forcing us not to live in healthy circumstances. It's challenging our ability to have clean water. It is creating droughts that are putting our food at risk. It is creating challenges with communicable diseases that we've never had before. That's why I call carbon pollution the biggest threat we have to public health today. But you know what it also is, is the biggest opportunity we have to invest in public health today. The biggest opportunity we have, because no matter whether you want to deny the science of climate change or not, we actually, it is actually happening. Now, I always make people, and this is mostly scientists that I talk to, so forgive me, you'll have to try to keep up here. It's just a joke. I'm not a scientist either. But when everybody comes up to me and says, Gina, what do I do when people say that climate change isn't real? I don't believe in it. Well, I tell them, first of all, it's not a belief system. And secondly, I always tell them to do, say three things. Are you ready? And you're going to repeat it after me so you can practice what you're going to say. Ready? Number one, climate change is real. Come on, climate change is real. Man-made emissions have caused it. Which is why women need to rule the world. Repeat that. Women need to rule the world. There you go. I knew I'd get somebody to yell that out. It's true. Did you see the election? Oh, we're taking over. That's what I say. Look it. Here's the, here's the challenge with, with climate change. The challenge with climate change is when, when we look at things like the Clean Power Plan, I will tell you that it, it, it made a difference. The main difference that it would have had in terms of sending signals was that we need innovation moving forward and we need it fast. It set, it set a path for clean energy that went out to 2030. We will miss that because we need a lot of innovation in this country today. Science is the basis of all of the progress that this country has made, not just on public health, but on every technology that we have ever developed that have, has improved our lives today. Science matters. It is what we have invested in in this country, and that sends a signal to the innovators about what we needed to do, and that signal's gone. But what you don't, may not realize is that even if the clean power plan ever goes away, what it was doing was tracking the way clean energy was moving. And today in the United States, we are moving faster and farther on clean energy than anyone ever anticipated. We are not going to lose step in terms of clean energy because it is in the marketplace. 
renewable energy is better than any other, uh, any other energy source in terms of its competitiveness in most markets. So we can call that a win, but what we need to do is keep moving forward, keep investing, keep sending signals to the great people in this country who have made this country great because they took technology forward. They understood the science, they did the research. And we need to recognize that as you do that, you are making the world a healthier place. Every time you invest in a climate action, it is improving our health today. So don't get discouraged. Don't let yourself think that there isn't a path forward on climate change that we can all embrace, because there is. Every mayor in this country spends a lot of money on infrastructure, including water and wastewater. Think about that through a climate lens. Think about climate through a health lens. Think about maximizing the investments you're making today, and we can continue to build a future that will be healthy for our kids. That's how we have to think. Not narrow-minded, not looking backwards, but looking forward about meeting our moral responsibility. And things will get better. We have to stop attacking scientists who say things that we don't like because we don't know what to do with them because they, does, don't, meet, they don't meet our sense of what the future ought to be. I will tell you I had this wonderful a uh, man who was in charge of our Office of Research and Development, and I loved him dearly, but every time he called me and I didn't know what he was calling for, I tried to pretend I wasn't home. <laughs> because I knew he was telling me something that I would likely not like to hear. Because it would be some problem he detected, some risk we didn't know about, work we needed to do on water and air. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. Do we have to do this? But every time I took that call, and guess what? You face up to the science you have, you look at the challenge, and you take action. And that's what we do in the United States of America. And in my world, ever since I've known how to regulate and how to do policy, I've worked at every level of government, and I will tell you categorically, having worked at the federal government for eight years, that nothing innovative starts at the federal government. So if you think just that what, because Washington doesn't feel like acting on things that we all know are important, that that's the end of the game, you're wrong. Because when I was at EPA and we moved forward, it was on the backs of decades of work at the grassroots level decades of work at the state level. It was on the backs of mayors who kicked butt in their community and showed other mayors how to move forward on the challenges of our time. And that's exactly what is happening today. As the federal government has checked out, everybody said, hey, there's space for me. All right. It's, it's 2,000 mayors who have signed up to live up to the Paris Agreement. They're trying hard to make this work and to tell the international community that while there's been, there's been uh, rose garden announcements about the U.S. leaving Paris, we're still in. It's about grassroots level who always have to face the challenges and can't deny the science because they're living with those challenges. It's their neighbors and their friends. They tackle those issues. They're the ones that identify the most vulnerable communities and demand that they be giving a, given a fair shot at economic development and health. And they scream and yell, they design strategies, and then when too many grassroots folks start organizing effectively, then states say, oh my God, I gotta do something. Then they do exactly what the grassroots said, and then the states get together and they start doing something, and then the federal government yells, oh, patchwork, patchwork, we can't live with this. Everything's happening in different states differently. We're gonna do something really creative, and then they pass a law that looks exactly like what the grassroots grassroots folks wanted in the beginning. That's how it works. So we, are, we have opportunity to be hopeful today. We actually, if you looked at all the science studies that came out, the IPCC report, the National Climate Assessment, most recently the, the Lancet Countdown Report, all happened within like the last month, month and a half. If you look at all of them, they talk about science. They understand that we have changes, but their bottom line is that we have the science. We have the technology. 
We actually even have the economic wherewithal in this world to tackle the challenge of climate change. What we actually lack solely is political will. Well, in the United States, where does political will get generated? It gets generated not just in your voting booth, but it gets generated by you and I, by making demands on our leaders that they protect our interests. And what interest is more fundamental than our health? That's why I am at the Harvard School of Public Health, because I'm a public health person. I want to look at climate and health and equity. I want to tell you the gobbledygook that scientists talk about and translate it in a ways that turn into actions that mayors can take, actions that community groups can take. Scientists are horrible communicators. They just talk to each other endlessly in journals that no one can read. So if we just take that out, tell somebody what it means, what its relevance is to their lives, then you're informing people. You're giving them the one thing that is most powerful in the world today, information. That's what we used to say in the 60s, information is power. It's still that. So let's stop being hopeless. Let's be hopeful. Let's protect our science. Let's protect our scientists. I will keep going out and yapping about the challenge of climate change, not just as a challenge, but as an opportunity. I will tell the young people that don't tell me what's happening today. Tell me what you're going to demand of your political leadership tomorrow. That's what matters most. That's what we need to do moving forward. And if you really look beyond your own noses, you will see that democracy is tingling right now. It's waking up. You don't just have mayors or, or grassroots folks, but you even have the business sector saying, oh, I have to invest with a purpose. You know what invest with a purpose actually means? making sure that people do business with us because people don't want to do business by businesses don't, that don't share their core values. We're going to start demanding that businesses be part of the solution, that they invest not just in short-term economic gains, but in overall in sustainable world that we all need. Businesses know that climate change is real. They know that we have to address it, and they know they have to be part of it. If you look at it, we have crazy things in the real world happening today that are called uh, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. We are marching in the streets. I haven't marched in decades. My tie-dyed shirts and my bell-bottoms don't fit me, but I'm wearing them anyways because they've been on mothballs for a long time. So we are waking up as a democracy. We have things to celebrate, things to do, and we can't do them because we are the United States of America. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions that were submitted online, so we'll kick off with those. Well, some might be here. Maybe they submitted them in advance, like we asked them. Got it. What a weakling, eh? Okay. What do we so, got? in your view, how does citizen science lead to action? Well, we had a, a really big and robust citizen science effort because what we what we realized when I was at EPA was that, you know, you really need to activate human beings to be able to understand what's going on in their communities and to do it in a way that empowers them. Because I'm a, just a big believer that good things happen down and it, it sort of pushes its way mm -hmm. up. And so uh, we have an ability now with new technology to be able to understand the air quality in this room with your wristwatch. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it gives you an ability not just to have an EPA with 15,000 people, but it gives you an ability to really demand action in your own communities and to understand the risks that you're under and to be able to make, you know, a, a, have an opportunity to engage at every level. I think it's a huge opportunity. I think it will only grow 
because I think, again, that that information, when you have information that's unfiltered, then, you, then people can begin to get more trust in the mm -hmm. actions they're demanding, get more focused in what they need to do, and can really work themselves to protect themselves. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think government shouldn't function, mm -hmm. and function well, and function in a bipartisan way. But uh, I can dream for a while, um, and it will, it will happen. But in the meantime, I think a lot of it's gonna rely on us being able to protect ourselves and be part of the solution not just raising demands about what, what's, what's gone wrong. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that humans will make the changes necessary to avert the worst effects of climate change before it's too late, or are the immediate economic costs too great for us to take action? Mm. I don't know who else is going to if it's not humans. <laughs> Can we have the fish do it? That, we have a lot here. Um, y yes and uh, no. The, the economic consequences, the economics on against taking climate action. You know, if you look at, there was a report I mentioned, the National Climate Assessment Report. If you get a chance, take a look at it, because here's the challenge with climate change, I think, is that it's complicated science, and you can't see it and taste it like we used to see and taste pollution before. So people get very complacent thinking that everything's okay, and they, and they can get fooled into thinking that everything's okay when it isn't. And, and so it, it's, it's really important for us to take a look at, at the National Climate Assessment because it looks at climate science in every, uh, climate, what's happening today and what that might mean if we don't make changes as we go into 2050 and 2100. And it looks region by region. So it makes it more personal. Mm -hmm. You can look up where you live and see, are they getting the challenges right? What, am I, what, what is everybody seeing? And what might my world look like if I don't do something? And so it notes all the, the forest fires mm -hmm. in California, the droughts, the fact that 10,000 ag workers have lost their jobs. It looks down south at, at the challenges with uh, heat stress. Um, with outdoor construction workers and others facing 90 plus degree days routinely on average, potentially. And it looks at the Northeast and the oceans rising and the challenges there. And, and so all, all of that is described. And, and it's, the reason why it's ho is helpful is that it gets more personal. Mm -hmm. It makes it more personal and and I you know the reason why I'm at the school of, of public health is to is to raise the health issue because I think nothing's more personal than that and I tell everybody you just got to put a face on climate change do it for your children for me it's I have a new grandson he's just four months old and he's the cutest child on the face of the universe that is fact not a belief system and, and it, he's my face for climate change. <laughs> my son, he's all right too, but, uh, but it's my grandson. He's the cutest thing. And, I, and I'll fight forever just for his right to have a, a healthy future. My old boss says that grandkids are the gift that you get for not killing your children. That is true. <laughs> but it, sometimes you d have to you know, choose wi which ones. Um, y you know, the, the, but the National Climate Assessment also has cost figures in it. And the real, the real thing that people don't seem to understand is like in 2017, it, it, it cost $317 billion in the United States alone mm -hmm. in lost assets because of these exacerbated weather events. Now, now, these extreme events, $317 billion off budget just to deal with those. Now, what I think this president was worried about in climate was we committed to $2 billion mm -hmm. in, in, in a green fund to be able to support people uh, around the world. And, and you tell me, we, how do you see the economics? Mm. <laughs> it's just way too expensive to let climate change happen. Mm. Thank you. Um, here's a great one. Thank you for all of your years of service. What advice do you have for a young female professional working in the environmental field? Well, first of all, I would tell you to think about public service. Um, it's where I have made my, my career and I loved every minute of it. You will not get rich, trust me on that one, uh, but you will have a tremendously rich life. 
Uh, when I was at EPA, uh, in, uh, before me was Lisa Jackson, and they, people in DC used to call it the SHEPA because we had so <laughs> many women um, oh running God. the agency, not just at the top levels. Women make really good managers. <laughs> Yeah, the challenge with environment is you can't just look at one single thing. Everything is a system. You know, it's, these are all systemic challenges. If you don't think about, it's like a balloon. If you poke it in one way, something's going to come out another end, another side. And you've got to anticipate that. That's w and so we had a wonderful opportunity to, to see really how good women are at thinking systemically and doing more than one thing at once. And we worked very hard to make sure we had a more diverse agency. And so I think that wim women in science are going to be extremely important. Women in politics and elected office are going to be important. But I would tell you, don't, uh, you know, just make sure you're open to new challenges and new things. Because I don't know about you, but many of us didn't start off in the environment field mm -hmm. in traditional f ways. But we got there because it fascinated us and we worked hard. So don't, you know, even if you're 35, 40 years old, you can still do this. There are ways in which you can do it. Just open up and, mm -hmm. and uh, be open to new challenges. That's great advice. Um, as a nation, uh, what do we need to do in communication with other nations to make these important changes? Yeah. Well, we really have to work together because as we all know, climate change isn't a localized issue and many of the core challenges we face environmentally are, are impacted by air that's coming from other countries and, and challenges that, that we are seeing in our fish in our oceans. I mean, there's no way that you can think about all of these issues as being geographically limited or as being just one issue without thinking of, of everything that, that it impacts. And so I think we just, we have to work together. Uh, we have to recognize that, that, that one of the real challenges of climate change that I think came out more strongly, and it still comes out very strongly, is the fact that climate change is, is, a, is a, a, a real uh, uh, national security challenge. Mm -hmm. If you look at, if you go and look at, at all the time since human beings are on the face of the earth, most of the conflict, uh, 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 most of the, the wars and battles have been fought around food and water. So if you think about it, climate change mm -hmm. has caused migrations that have created instabilities in the world. Mm -hmm. Many, including me, think that the war in Syria was heavily influenced by a series of droughts in that mm -hmm. country. If you look at the migrations coming from Central America over the past few years, you'll see a lot of them are because 90% of the agricultural land became too dry or acidic to be able to grow crops. You can't take that kind of a loss and not expect that people won't want to go to where life is better and where they can feed their kids. Mm -hmm. And so there, there, are, there are real challenges that demand that we work internationally. The US needs to remember its place in the world, which was as the strongest country and the one that led others. When we remember that we are, we're part of a larger universe and that our future depends on our ability to be able to continue to be a leader in the world, mm -hmm. when we remind ourselves of that again and take it on, we'll have an ability to be able to influence the change we need. Great. And, and we, we need to do that desperately. Thank you, and um, shifting gear for another advice question. What advice do you have for a high school biology or other science teacher to help motivate or prepare high school students to be future innovators and activists? Well, my, my major advice would be to start another career path because high schoolers are pains <laughs> in the neck. <laughs> I've had three, they're miserable human <laughs> beings. Get them to college, they start being okay again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, here's the, the big flaw, I think, in that I saw, and this could be better now, um, I don't know, but, you know, science is best taught when you, when you do, when you 
make the students understand its relevance. You know, chemistry drove me crazy, and, and, me and my, my kids would come home saying, you know, and they have to learn the periodic table and stuff, and they'd wonder, why do I need to know the mass of this or that? I'm like, hey, I work on oil spills, if, if I don't know the mass, I don't know if it floats or sinks. How do you deal with this stuff? And nobody gives them, nobody gives students the, the idea of why it's relevant to the world to learn science and what it means and why all these things are so important. You know, one of the things that, that uh, I think people do better today than they did before is teach these concepts as part of a case study. Make it relevant, put it into context so that students can understand why learning this is not just a pain in the butt, but actually informs you and is relevant in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest task we have as teachers, is to not, not memorize, but learn. Mm -hmm. And this, that's two different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And get more money, we gotta pay our <laughs> teachers more money. I know a lot of people here would be very happy to hear that. <laughs> um, what are your concerns about an increasing global population when we reach 10 million or 15 billion and beyond? How is that yeah. going to impact uh, well, our well, environment? The last projections I saw was, were that it, in uh, 2050, there is likely to be something in the order of 9.6 billion people Two-thirds of them will be living in urban areas, and 75% of the buildings are not even constructed yet to be mm -hmm. able to allow wow. them to live in urban areas. The, we are building like a, a, as many buildings as a city like every week or so in the world. Mm. It's amazing. So I, I'm worried about uh, the, the resource challenges related mm -hmm. to that. I'm worried about how you design an urban area. How do you look at not just having efficient buildings, but, but buildings that are healthy? Mm -hmm. I'm worried about the transportation challenges and the pollution from transportation if we don't shift to an electrified system, if we don't first think about public transportation before we think about cars mm -hmm. to service those areas. I'm worried about water. I, I think water is the, is, is the quiet issue that deserves to be front and center. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about too much and too little. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm not worried about a thing. <laughs> Just those few things. Except food. Except food. Yeah. Which is the big kahuna here. Yeah. You know, the challenge that we face is that if, if even if all these people are uh, more centralized in urban areas, you still need so much more fertile land in order to feed 9.6 billion people that you will not have the, the uh, carbon taken up in our forests mm -hmm. as, as you need to. And so it, the equation doesn't add up unless we think about substantial ways of rethinking our lives and our diet. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the fun things about being at Harvard is that you work with guys that, there's a guy named Walter Willett who really helped um, uh, it, it, he focuses on nutrition, and he's uh, putting out a Lancet report with a bunch of other researchers uh, next month that's going to look at what is actually a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. And I told him as a red meat eater, I admitted that, will I be able to eat red meat? He said, sure, store it up for the month, <laughs> which means not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just too high, it's, yeah. it's just, no, it, it is not the best source of protein. And then he's looking at what are the sources of protein in a low carbon future. Mm -hmm. And one of the other challenges you probably have never heard of is that in a high CO2 atmosphere, it sucks nutrients out of grains, like mm. rice, wheat, essential nutrients. Mm. So we're really gonna have to think hard about how to feed that many people without undermining our ability to have carbon balanced appropriately. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what are the most impactful ways that an individual can voice their support for policy that addresses climate change? Vote. Vote. As President Obama would say, don't boo, vote. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's the best. But I'm, I mean, I'm not even talking about Washington or, or a, a president. I'm, I'm just talking about even at the local level, 
make sure that people are being thoughtful about this, that they look beyond cliches mm -hmm. or slogans, that they actually gen genuinely are there because they care about their constituents and the public that they serve instead of their own ego or their, uh, they have their own agenda. Uh, that's, we need to get back to that. And, and uh, honestly, vote for people that want to work for Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're, they're all human beings as far as I know, and they're the ones that we serve no matter what party you're in. When you get voted in, you better serve it all. And I, I'm getting tired of the, the partisanship. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just dehumanizing us and the separating our country. Yeah. I think this one's interesting too. Uh, who were some of your heroes growing up and how have they influenced your career? Hmm. Well, um, uh, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think uh, I think Rachel Carson is the obvious choice. Um, I think for me, uh, because she was such a major influence in my yo younger days. Uh, but I, I would have to say I loved Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. you know, does everybody know Jane Goodall? She's still hanging around and doing great stuff. I went to um, and Margaret Mead. I love Margaret Mead. Loved Margaret Mead. I was a wannabe anthropologist. I still am. <laughs> if I had a, a chance. But when I graduated from college, I graduated with a degree in social anthropology, mm -hmm. mainly because I adore people and ch different cultures I find fascinating. And, and, uh, and I always tell people, they say, well, what, what good did that do you when you went in government? And I used to tell them, that an understanding of primitive cultures is what has made me successful with state legislatures and Congress. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, 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 I love people and I love differences. I love diversity. Mm -hmm. And those people taught me that, that you, need to, you need to study people yeah. or you need to study primates, wherever you are, and take them where they are and learn to listen before you talk. And, and I, I was always the person that was unafraid of differing opinions. I actually enjoy that, mm -hmm. to find the right balance in life. And I think we're forgetting that now, that mm -hmm. compromise is what life is about. I don't know how some of these people that won't listen to one another stay married. <laughs> Maybe they don't. Mm -hmm. But that's the uh, compromise is, is life to me, and, and I like it. And I think that's what democracy is about. I don't think we make big leaps and bounds. I think we always make steady progress because we listen to what's best for everybody. This kind of builds on that question. One could argue that we are at a particularly interesting time in history with humans needing to deal with the global complexity. Interesting. Mm -hmm. interesting. Yes. <laughs> Uh, with humans needing to deal with the global complexity of climate change for our own survival, has having an academic background that includes anthropology informed your work as a result? Yeah, t totally. I, it, it's no, it's it seriously has. Uh, I I think I I love the resilience of the human spirit. Um, I love the fact that people approach issues differently. Mm -hmm. I think teams are the way that things get done. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at a management style if for a, a complex issues like the environment or, or climate, it has to come from differing points of view, differing uh, expertise. Um, and, and I think that, that that's how uh, the world has to be approached because we now know enough uh, from science that for every yin, there's a yang. For every decision you make, there's things that happen that you didn't anticipate. And you have to think in teams. And, and uh, I think, uh, it, really, the study of anthropology told me uh, why I love people, uh, why the complexity of that is important, and why everybody can add value when they're, we're brought into a team. But without everybody, without a team approach, you will inevitably miss really consequential issues. So it's influenced not only my love of being in government and digging in and trying to find a way to make progress, but it, it's also, you know, 
I think, uh, made me a better person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly a better public servant because public service is about listening more than it's about talking. It's about not knowing the answer when you start, but making that answer come out of the debate and the discussion. Um, it really annoys me when, when people go into government and they think they know it all before they've even heard anybody else's view of life because it will inevitably change what you think mm -hmm. if you listen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this one is um, related to uh, land protection. Mm -hmm. Obviously there was a lot of great uh, protections under your administration um, and obviously we care greatly about marine protected areas yes. and here at the aquarium. So what are your views on mining for oil in some of these protected areas, like in Alaska? And seismic testing and all yeah. of the other things that are potentially happening in some of these areas. Is it, is it too simple to say I don't agree with it? No. I don't agree with it. Uh, you know, I, 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 that, that's one of those issues of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, um, I could go into a long story, I won't, but the long and short of it is that, that human beings are fallible. Um, when you go into a sensitive area and you actually think that you can protect it by being invasive in some way, which is what you're talking about, more often than not, we don't know enough to be able to ensure protections. And the challenge we have today is that they're not only sort of opening these lands for exploration. Uh, that's not the right word. What's the word I'm looking for? Exploitation. Thank you, exploitation. B but they're, but they're, they're, um, they're shortcutting the environmental review process too. Mm -hmm. And there couldn't be a worse marriage <laughs> that will produce I unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And then everybody will walk away and go, I didn't know. Well, you should have. <laughs> and so I, I, am, I am really worried about it. And frankly, I'm, I'm surprised that it's happening without m much more uh, public outcry. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we live at a time when everything is, seems to be at stake. And as a result, we're not mustering the courage to attack anyone. Mm -hmm. And so I, I worry about it a lot. I don't understand it. I, I just simply don't understand it. There are precious places that, w that we simply shouldn't be invading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got one more, and then maybe we can open it up to the floor, because I think we may have just a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. So your public service includes local, state, and federal appointments. What are similarities or differences you've seen in how science is incorporated into policies oh, at those different question. levels of government? Well, uh, the, uh, uh, at, at EPA, it was a science agency. I mean, that's what we did. You know, uh, we, had, we had scientists up the yin yang. <laughs> I mean, we we had to make evidence based decisions. Mm -hmm. In many t many ways, I think we were being asked to do more science than was necessary under common sense mm -hmm. to be able to make decisions. And I'll say that's that that is definitely I think the case when when it had to do with toxics. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just. I think we were being asked to do too much before we were able to actually pass laws that protected people. Mm. And I don't like to pass a law where you're counting how many people died for the past 20 years while you contemplated the science. That's not how it ought to work. So I think, so it was heavily about science. Some of it required under law and, and others just the judgment needed to be made about how you can do a federal rule that is fair and equitable given the diversity of the United States and its needs. So it was challenging. Um, let, let me just cut down. The state level, remember most of the science for the environmental rules are done at the federal level mm -hmm. and then that science is then applied at the state level oftentimes uh, states go further than that. Depending upon what your state is, I've usually worked for very progressive states mm -hmm. 
So you've got Massachusetts and Connecticut. They often use, uh, supplemented the science and looked at what it meant for their state and went further. But when you get to the local level, there's very little ability to do science as applied to look at practical implications of what science has done, it, it tells you. And frankly, that's why it's way more fun. <laughs> the local level work is so much fun because it's all about what's it mean for your community and what do you do hands on to make sure that your community is protected. So it was, it was a blast. I loved working at the local level. And if you're not a people person and you work at the local level, you're gonna find yourself out the door in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm which I love too. Every pothole and. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, I, I'd, you'd be, uh, you'd be, uh, I worked, my first job at the local level, I worked where I lived in the same town. Mm -hmm. So I'd be out grocery shopping and people would be coming up to me talking about the septic system overflowing next door. I'm like, must you tell me these things? I at just least it was in the grocery store. Lettuce. Leave me alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> you, you're, you're, yeah, you can't get away from it. Yeah. It's fun. It's really fun. Great. Do you want to? Any other? I think oh, we got a couple of excited people. So. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on carbon emissions cap and trade versus a carbon tax. Yeah. Um, I, I think eventually we're going to be looking at a carbon tax. Um, I think it, a market-based approach, I think, is good. Both of them are market-based approaches. Um, right now, I think because of, of political sensitivities, um, cap and trade seems to be the, the approach that you can get through because it's, um, it, it is um, uh, it just more politically acceptable. Um, and I'm, I'm not a big believer in the tax and dividend approach. I know that everybody says that's great because people like it to get a check in their hands, but I like to have government be supported because I don't know how else you tra transform an urban area or look at transportation differently. You, you gotta have resources. And so I worry about tax and dividend, complete tax and dividend. Now in terms of cap and trade, I think cap and trade, I started uh, with a number of other people, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. I think it's worked beautifully. We're trying to now extend it to look at transportation and capturing that as well. It's worked well. Um, California is obviously generating a lot of, of revenue to be able to, to support uh, climate action. The challenge with cap and trade is there are a lot of communities that believe that it is inequitable that it, it doesn't necessarily address the needs of the communities that need actions the most. Mm -hmm. California, it, for example, was delayed in their cap and trade program because of this very issue. Um, the court stopped the program until that was resolved. And there's still a lot of challenges with dealing with the equity issue, which is why I see carbon as inextricably linked both health and equity issues. Now we face that issue with the Clean Power Plan, which is a market-based approach. It opens up opportunities for states to reduce their emissions from utilities, looking in a number of different ways, including you know, cap and trade partnerships, national level, regional level. And what we did to address the equity issue is we double the value of offsets if you did work in low income and minority communities. So there's ways in which you can integrate that consideration in, and that's what you have to be smart about. But it is a big consideration for both a tax and, an, and a, a cap and trade program. So um, you said the best way that we can help change is to vote, but I am not old enough to vote yet. So until then, <laughs> like what what all can be done besides voting? I'm sorry, voting? I, I never should have stopped at that. That was kind of rude, sorry. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, there's lots of things you can do in your community. I, I remember one time when I was in Connecticut, we used to give out climate awards. And at one award ceremony, I gave an award to somebody who was 82 <laughs> and somebody who was 12. The same, and we stood them up together. It was the coolest thing. The guy, 82, lived in a nursing home, or, sorry, assisted living at that time. 82, he was in good shape. And, but he convinced his, his uh, uh, assisted living facility 
to use all energy efficient light bulbs, to get solar energy. I mean, he did this, this really great program, which was what I was rewarding him for. But the 12 year old went out and, and basically sold renewable e um, energy credits to different neighborhoods so that his school could get a solar panel on it. He basically, it, he made commit, got them to commit to doing renewable energy. And it was really cool. And so kids actually can make a difference. It doesn't matter what your age is. You, there are things you can do at your local community or at your school to talk about the science. Join your, there's usually environmental you know, committees or teams or technologies or groups at schools. Join that, learn, talk, talk to one another, work in your community if you can. Do cleanups, beach mm -hmm. cleanups, water cleanups. You know, join groups that want to want to uh, regenerate wetland areas. Learn about the Chesapeake. You know, get active. There's so many things you can do that are fun to do, um, and stay healthy yourself. Get out and romp around and play. It's a really good thing. And get your nose out of those stupid <laughs> video games. <laughs> no offense to those who develop video games. <laughs> They're addictive, and they're not very healthy. Talk to our field conservation team. We'll sign you up for a lot of cleanups. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Good. I think we can do one more. One more. Um, thank you. Um, I I saw that um, most of the decisions in the EPA were made based on um, humans and human benefits. In what ways um, can we pass laws, um, and can I help to benefit um, animals and plants specifically? Yeah, that's that's a re that's a really good question. Um, you're absolutely right. I'm trying to think of of any one of our rules that was really looking at impact on plants. Wildlife, yes. Um, you know, there, there are different federal agencies that, that have different laws. I mentioned that the US EPA is really a public health agency because essentially we were looking at public health. Now, there are such a, such a thing as unintended consequences or what you call uh, costs or benefits that go outside that area. So if we were doing something, for example, let me give you an example. I did a rule called the clean water rule that looked at how to protect sensitive water that was, that was uh, feeding drinking water supplies for about 130 million people that rely on rivers and streams that are currently unprotected. And I did a rule, and we actually needed to look at the impact on wetlands. We actually needed to look at how groundwater moved. We actually had to look at at prairie potholes and all of the value that they provide, which are these big, you know, sort of areas that, that are periodically wet, where ducks are, ducks unlimited love prairie potholes. These are areas that are environmentally very sensitive. But beyond that, EPA's job was not to look at those issues, it was mainly the Department of the Interior, where mostly they are what I call the birds and bunnies agency. Um, they didn't like being characterized like that, but I thought it was cute. <laughs> well, thank you. And Gina, thank you so much for this great conver and lively conversation this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We have 2019 lectures that are in the works right now. Please visit aqua.org slash lecture for more information. And if you're on our email list, you will receive information about future lectures as soon as it is available. You can also visit aqua.org to join that email list and to find out more information. So thank you all for being here with us tonight and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody.